to you about protein. You uh, now know all about carbs and lipids, well, at least you did before the break, but uh, that's not a problem because I make sure to uh, remind you of everything that's relevant to study this third group of macronutrients, which is protein. Um, before we start, uh, I would like to bring up, this is horrible, I would like to bring up three uh, misconceptions that are quite common uh, about protein and that I'm sure that the not so uh, nutritionally educated family here, the, the fat family on the slide, would probably share. Um, the first one that protein is the good stuff. Uh, a lot of people who do not have a lot of knowledge of, of nutrition have this concept on the back of their mind that protein is somehow what you really should be looking for in food when you eat, like the stuff you need to grow strong and maintain your tissues. And, and that is of course true, but now of course you know better. You know that carbs and fats are equally as important. They are important energetic molecules. We need them also for structural functions and also for regulatory functions. The essential fatty acids, we cannot survive without them. So all three the macronutrients are vital, are very important for us, not only protein. The other one is that protein is animal, meaning animal food is the best somehow source of protein in our diet. And again, this is not uh, completely true because plants are also very good sources of protein, which is the reason why the lean family in our previous slide was able to perfectly thrive on their vegan diet. And then the last one is protein makes muscle. Uh, well, protein does not. Exercise makes muscle. Protein is a component of muscle. We need a little bit more protein if we want to build new muscle, but certainly eating protein alone doesn't have by itself any kind of anabolizing effect. It's like you wouldn't throw there a bunch of bricks and think you're building a house. You still have to do it. If you just eat extra protein and do nothing else, it will just convert this protein to fat and get fat. And certainly not athletic. Um, so, Okay, this is weird. Well, let's look at the top one. Proteins are the main structural material in our body. 62% of our body weight is water, thereby making water the most important structural material in our bodies, what really keeps us in shape. But then the second, the second most abundant uh, structural material is protein. 17% of our body weight is protein. So our muscles, our bones, our skins, all of our organs, our hair, our uh, nails, protein is that the, the stuff all these things are made of. But then on top of that, proteins also have key regulatory functions in our body. A lot of hormones uh, all the enzymes, the carriers, the transporters, the signaling molecules, the antibodies for immune function, and, and we will go into detail of all this function later. But this is just to say that proteins are vital to a lot of metabolic processes. So they not only give us structure, but they are also what make all this structure work. And then, of course, I have no clue what's going on, but now we, have, we look at the third. Um, protein can also be used for energy. So sure enough, they provide four kilocalories per gram, so just about like carbs, if you remember. Uh, and actually, protein will eventually give you a little bit less, but uh, they can be used for energy, although using protein for energy is kind of a waste. Our body doesn't really like to use protein for energy um, because they are normally used for other more important structural and <coughs> regulatory functions. Yes, we know that. Now, what a protein is, is a chain of amino acids that are linked together by peptide bonds. So a protein, you can imagine it as a linear chain of the single units, these building blocks that are the amino acids that are linked together by this type of bond that I will show you later. And so they will form this linear sort of necklace of uh, amino acid. 
that will then fold into the three-dimensional space to acquire its characteristic form, its characteristic shape, that is what most of the time will give protein its biological functions. But if any time we take a protein and unfold it, we will end up with a linear chain of amino acids linked together one after the other. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins and our body needs to build thousands of different proteins for all its structural and regulatory functions. But all these thousands of different proteins are made with only 20 different <coughs> amino acids. So the basic building blocks we need to build all the thousands of proteins that we may need to build is only the 20 amino acids. And by combining them in different combinations or in different numbers, because the protein can be made of three amino acids or can be made of thousands of amino acids in sequence. And then we can build all the proteins we need with these 20 uh, basic building blocks. So you can um, imagine that what we really need when we eat protein from food is not really the protein that we are after. The protein we eat from um, our plants, our animals, they will have their specific biological functions in the plants or the animal that they come from, but we don't care about the function. We only care about the pieces, so we care about the amino acids. So we will take that protein, as you can see here, we, we eat protein from foodstuff. These little circles will represent the amino acids. You see they are linked together to form this chain, which is the protein with, with its function. We don't care about the function, we just break it down into the single uh, amino acids that make that protein so that then we can take the amino acids and reassemble them together to form other proteins. The proteins that we need with the functions we need that is not anymore related in any way to the original function of the protein we ate. We only are after the pieces so that we can build the protein we need. And now, um, here we represent the amino acids as this little circle. Uh, well, how an amino acid really look like is more of like this. You can uh, recognize that there is a central atom of carbon that like any good central atom of carbon will make four bonds. One is made with hydrogen here. Another is made with this carboxyl group, is an acid group, uh, carbon, double bond, oxygen, bond, oxygen, but hydrogen, that you're already familiar with this because it's the same a carboxyl group that you have at the terminal end of your fatty acids is what makes them acidic. But then we have a little surprise here. We have an amino group, which is nitrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. And if you think back to your uh, carbohydrates and lipids, there are no nitrogen in carbs and fats. So protein are our only, well not our only, but our main source of nitrogen, which we need. So on top of uh, carbon and oxygen and hydrogen, uh, amino acids also bring us uh, nitrogen. And then this R here is not really an element, it's just a shorthand for a side group that will vary and will determine the specific amino acid. So this bottom part here is the same for all our 20 different amino acids, and then what will change is this side group. So for example, uh, if the side group is just an atom of hydrogen, we will have made up the simplest amino acid, which is glycine. If instead of hydrogen, we put there a, a methyl group, carbon, hydrogen, 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 that's alanine. And so on, you can build all the 20 different amino acids by changing that side group. So this is an amino acid, but then we said, all right, now we want to make a protein, and a protein is a chain of amino acids linked together, so now we need to bind them. And we do that with a peptide bond uh, that works like that. You can see here, uh, there is uh, two amino acids. You will recognize the carboxyl uh, uh, group here, and then the amino group of the other. The peptide bonds uh, will happen through elimination of a molecule of water. We take oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen from this group, so this is a condensation reaction. Water will leave, and then we will form a covalent bond between the carbon of the carboxyl group of an amino acid and the nitrogen of the amino group of the other, so they will share their pair of electrons, and now they are bound. And of course, each amino acid can make two of these bonds, one on one side and one on the other. So for example, this nitrogen of this amino group will be able to bind to the carbon of a carboxyl group of another amino acid, 
and this carbon of the carboxyl group will be able to bind to a nitrogen of an amino group or yet another amino acid, and this way we can build the chain as long as we want. Thousands of amino acids if, if needed. This uh, process of building proteins from amino acids is what we call protein synthesis, and this happens in our cells. This uh, picture is one of the cells. Now I quickly go through how it is happens. Of course, those of, of you who have studied biochemistry already know this more in detail, but here we just summarize how it is. And then on the next slide, I will write a few sentences down to summarize again the same concept. So this is a cell. You can recognize that there is a nucleus, and then outside the nucleus there is a cytoplasm, still inside the cell but outside of the nucleus. And inside the nucleus we have DNA which contains the information that's necessary to make our protein. So when we need to build a protein, suppose we need to make insulin, so now we would be in, in the pancreas, we first go and look for the uh, genetic instruction, the code, the, the recipe to, to make insulin in our DNA, which tells us what is the sequence of amino acids that we need to put together to end up with that specific protein. So we open up this sort of recipe book at the gene of insulin uh, that is written in, in DNA language, so it has a sequence of nucleotides that will then be translated, but basically say, okay, this is the sequence you need to make insulin. And because this is very precious molecule, this is a precious recipe book, it will not go out of the nucleus uh, to the cytoplasm for transcription. It will first be copied into another molecule, the messenger uh, RNA. So we will first make a copy of the instructions it, it, it actually would do not only make one, we make many. Imagine you take this recipe book and you make many photocopies of it. And then this can safely go out uh, through these pores uh, in the nucleus into the cytoplasm to these other structures that you already know, the ribosomes. And if, if DNA is the recipe book, then the ribosomes are the cook that will take this recipe, will take the mRNA, read it, and start building the protein uh, following the instructions. But, of course, this is not as easy because, as I said, the recipe for protein in mRNA is written in a different language. So it also needs to be translated into protein language. And what does that is this other molecule here, the transferred RNA, the tRNA, that will be able to tell, okay, this is the uh, nucleotide here. This means you need to take this amino acid. So um, we'll take the amino acid, we'll make a peptide bond with the other, the previous one on the chain, and you will end up with this chain, which again would be a sequence of amino acid. And then on to the next one. Here we have the instruction, three nucleotides. The, TR the tRNA will say, all right, this means take this amino acid. We will take it, bind it to the previous one, and so on. We will, this chain of amino acid will grow. All right, and this is how, how we make protein. And because many ribosomes are, are working on the mRNA at the same time, this will go very fast. So this will basically say the same thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's a lot of stuff. But it's the same thing I just said. DNA in the nucleus contains the coded instructions to make our proteins. These instructions will be copied to mRNA, and then this will be able to exit the nucleus and be transferred to the cytoplasm. Ribosomes in the cytoplasm will then read this mRNA and start building proteins by adding one amino acid at a time. The tRNA, transferred RNA, will provide the translation between the DNA language, which is the sequence of nucleotides, and protein language, which is the sequence of amino acids that our protein is made of. And so this is where the actual translation will happen. And now here's a new concept. The sequence of amino acid in the protein will determine its final shape. So this linear chain will then fold, we said, in the three-dimensional space to have a specific shape. But the way it does that is not random. Uh, it is actually determined from the linear chain of amino acid itself. So once we have the linear chain of amino acid, there's only really one possible way that it will fold in the three-dimensional space and depends on the sequence of amino acids, the way they will interact. And this is very important because most of the proteins work only because they have a specific shape. So the final shape will determine the biological function of the protein. 
but this shape is direct consequence of the sequence of amino acid of the linear chain just as they come uh, off of the ribosomes. And to illustrate how this is important, in, in your book there is this example of sickle cell anemia uh, that is a genetic disease uh, whereby you have a little mistake in the recipe for hemoglobin. So in your DNA, the gene encoding for hemoglobin has a little mistake uh, that will result in a wrong amino acid in the chain of this protein. And hemoglobin, as you know, is an important protein for your red blood cells so that they can then efficiently carry oxygen. Um, this mistake will result in the fact that in position 6 of the chain of this protein, you will have valine instead of glutamate. So one amino acid <coughs> instead of the other. But this is enough that the protein will then fold three-dimensionally in a completely different way, which is dysfunctional. And because the shape is what determines the function of a protein, this will result in a totally dysfunctional red blood cell itself. So you can see the whole structure of the red blood cell, this is not the protein, this is the whole red blood cell, will have a completely weird shape that is not as efficient in carrying oxygen. And this depends on the wrong shape of hemoglobin, which depends on just one little amino acid put in place of the other. So you see how important it is that the, the, the sequence of amino acids is the right one and how this then determines the final shape of the protein and how the final shape is important for the function of the protein itself. And so you can imagine that if a protein loses its three-dimensional shape, it will also lose its biological function. Uh, the loss of three-dimensional structure of a protein is what we call protein denaturation. So it is basically the unfolding of the protein back to a wrong shape or to its original linear shape. The linear shape will be conserved, but the function is now lost. And this can be uh, something that we do not want, for example, for the protein in our body. We, our insulin that we just built, we don't want it to be denaturated because then it will lose its function. Um, but in other circumstances, this would be something we actually want. Think protein digestion. We said before, what we care about digestion is not preserving the function. We don't care about the function. We just want the pieces. And so the denaturation of the protein now will be something we want because it will just make it easier to unfold the protein and then start breaking it down to get the single amino acids that then we can use. So one of the goals of protein digestion will actually be protein denaturation. And there are um, many ways that you can accomplish protein denaturation. These are the most important. Heat is the most uh, important way you can uh, accomplish protein denaturation. So you, you have here your uh, uh, egg with a transparent and liquid part. If you cook it, it will become white and solid. And this is irreversible. If you cool it down, it will not go back to transparent. Uh, and this is a result of denaturation of the uh, proteins of the egg white induced by heat. And in general, every time you cook uh, a food that contains protein, uh, you will, to some extent, have some protein denaturation, which is in general good because it will then make digestion of that food easier. Another way you can uh, do that is with enzymes, and again, think digestion. Uh, some enzymes will actually help unfolding the protein to accomplish more efficient digestion. We can denature a protein with high or low pH solution. Again, think digestion. In your stomach, there is a very acidic uh, environment that will totally uh, help protein denaturation. Um, or, I don't know if you've ever squeezed some lemon juice in milk and you will immediately see protein precipitate, that's kappa casein that is partially denaturated by the effect of the acidity of lemon juice, and also agitation, which you also have to some extent in digestion, if you think of that shaking, that it's basically to move things uh, on and to help lipid digestion, but it also to some extent will help unfold proteins. Or if you've ever tried to make mayonnaise, 
you know that you have to agitate your egg yolk so that you can denature the protein and incorporate your oil, because if you do not do that, it will just end up with a sort of disgusting mixture of uh, egg yolk and oil. On to the next concept of essential amino acids. One amino acid, as you probably already have realized, cannot substitute for another in protein synthesis. We'll see how the code for building a protein is in very detail written in our DNA. We cannot just take another amino acid and replace it. Did you see what happened in sickle cell anemia? You just replace one and you mess up everything. Um, Luckily, however, of the 20 amino acids that we need to build all, all our different proteins, 11 can be interconverted into one another. So, and this is the transamination reaction, meaning if we need a specific amino acid to build a specific protein and we do not have it, in most cases we can take another and using stuff that's usually ready, readily available around the cell, we can convert it into another amino acid which we can then use. However, we cannot do that with the remaining nine essential amino acids. And we call them essential just because of that, because we cannot make them ourselves. These nine amino acids cannot be interconverted or made starting from something else, and so they must come directly from food. And we need all of them, because if we miss just one, then we will be in trouble when we need it. And this is a table you have in your book showing the different essential amino acids. I don't have to remember names, but just the concept that these nine essential amino acids are the ones that we cannot build ourselves, and the other 11 can be somehow interconverted into one another. And to uh, illustrate again this fact, I will bring another little example. <clears throat> Imagine the cell needs to build this imaginary simple protein. It's just a three peptide, so made of three amino acids, glycine, aspartate, and lysine. And so what will happen is we'll look for the uh, instructions in the DNA, make our RNA, bring it to the cytoplasm, we give it to the ribosome that will start reading it and say, okay, so to make this protein we need glycine. And imagine this is the pool of amino acids that's available in that specific cell at that specific moment. We need glycine, here's glycine, so we can take it, that's good. And on to the next one, now we need aspartate, but oh, oh, we do not have any aspartate. However, it turns out aspartate is one of the non-essential amino acids, and it can be made from glutamate. So what we will do is we can take glutamate, make a transamination to aspartate, and now we're good to go. We can take aspartate, bring it next to the glycine, make a covalent bond, our peptide bond, and on to the next one, now we need lysine. Again, there's no lysine available, but now we are in trouble because lysine is one of the nine essential amino acids. So we, there's no way we can make lysine starting from what we have. It doesn't matter. We can have thousands of other amino acids, but we'll be stuck, and we will not be able to make the protein we need because lysine is essential. We don't have it. It doesn't matter how much protein we have. Unless we have that amino acid, we are stuck. We cannot go on with our protein synthesis, which, of course, is not good. Uh, so... This brings us to the uh, so-called all-or-none principle, which says depletion of just one essential amino acid prevents protein synthesis. We do not have lysine. There's no way we can make our protein using something else. And so either all essential amino acids are available or none can be used. It doesn't matter that we have a lot of the other ones. We, we want that one that we need. And then on top of that, uh, the remaining amino acid cannot even be stored for later use because our body doesn't really have any system to store uh, proteins or amino acids. So we cannot even say, all right, we don't have lysine, we will just save this and, uh, for later, and then once we have lysine, we bring them back and make our protein. No, it doesn't happen. We cannot store them, so if we have no use for them at that specific moment, we will have to throw them away or use them for something else, but certainly not for protein synthesis, which is the most important use we have for amino acid. <coughs> and
And so you see the quality of a protein, uh, food, or a protein source, depends on its essential amino acid content. Our protein requirement will require a total amount of protein, like how many grams of protein we need. But it also will have a requirement for quality. So we want to make sure that we have all the nine essential amino acids, because if we don't have all of them, then we can have all the protein we need. We will have no use for it, for protein synthesis, if, if we lack just one of the essential amino acids we need. And so there is this example. Uh, back to the beginning of the 19th century, this French scientist, Francois Magendie. Um, back then, they already had these early nutrition studies, and they knew that protein was very important. And actually, back then, they thought that protein was the, real, the, the only thing you really needed. But they also knew that protein sources, the, the richest protein sources, were very expensive. Uh, there was, however, this food, gelatin, that is an animal source of protein, a lot of protein, 86% of protein per dry weight. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar on how gelatin is made. It's, it's not the best thought. It's, it's made from collagen. So basically, we'll take <coughs> bones and skins of animals, dairy, chicken, fish. You will boil this for a very, very long time, and you will end up with a sticky thing that you would can then dry and get this powder that has a very nice property. Uh, if you heat it, it will form a very nice, tasteless, reversible gel with water. Reversible meaning you can heat it up, it will become liquid, you cool it down, it will become solid, and you can do this over and over again. And so the food industry really likes that, because uh, to make, I suppose, um, re ready-to-eat food, or sauces, or meat products. And of course, if you put some sugar and colors and flavor, you, you make your jello dessert. But for Francois Magendie, this was the solution to the hunger problem. He said, this is a rich source of protein, it's very cheap, uh, it must be very good. So he gave it to a group of dogs, expecting that they would thrive, and instead they would die. Again, it's every reason that citation, that's what he said. Um, but today we know that collagen, yes, it is a very rich source of protein, but it is a very, very low quality protein, because it lacks not one, but four of the essential amino acids. Tryptophan, isoleucine, threonine, methionine. So it doesn't matter that you have a lot of protein from gelatin, it's protein that you cannot use because you will lack four of the important essential amino acids. So, uh, high protein, low quality. This is a typical example to illustrate uh, how protein quality is as important as the quantity. And then, another little concept, the one of conditionally essential amino acid. These are amino acids that are not strictly essential meaning we can build them ourselves, but we can only build them starting from essential amino acid that may be lacking, uh, maybe we don't have enough, maybe we're using a lot, so it that then become lacking as well. Take tyrosine, it is conditionally essential because we can make tyrosine from phenylalanine, but phenylalanine is essential, so if, if we lack phenylalanine, we will lack tyrosine as well. Phenylketonuria patient, they lack the enzyme, to make this conversion. This is another genetic defect. Those people will not be able to take phenylalanine and make tyrosine, and this will result in two different problems. The first one is, as you can expect, tyrosine then becomes essential, because now you cannot make it from anything else. And tyrosine is also very important because the metabolism of phenylalanine will then lead to the production of dopamine and acetylcholine, epinephrine, a, lot of, a bunch of important hormones and neurotransmitters. But also, they will have uh, to be very careful and strictly control their phenylalanine intake. Because if they will have excess of it, they cannot metabolize it, they will accumulate it, and phenylalanine is neurotoxic. So this would result in serious uh, neurological damage. Which is the reason why, if you remember when you studied your uh, artificial sweeteners, if whenever a food contains aspartame, it has to carry the warning, you know, this is a source of phenylalanine. So, uh, PKU patients, uh, beware. Um, and of course, these people know, because all newborns are tested for PKU, uh, so that then uh, their diet can be strictly controlled. And we see uh, the sources of protein in our diet. 
animal food as is uh, this is why it's very clear that it's a good source of protein because it has a lot of protein and it also have a very high protein quality. It has a lot of the, all the essential amino acids we need and if you think about it, because our requirement for essential amino acids is basically how our body is made and so you can expect that animal food will have a composition similar to ourselves. Yeah, ideally human meat would be the highest protein quality which you can expect, but of course it's not polite to uh, eat your roommate for lunch. So then you turn to other uh, animals. And here you have um, some uh, numbers. You don't have to write down the numbers, of course. It's just you have an idea. This is percent weight. So that means 100 grams of egg have 13 grams of protein. Quite a lot. Meat, 15 to 20 percent. Fish, about the same. Tuna has a little bit more. Milk, uh, yogurt, 3 percent. It doesn't look much, but keep in mind that milk is primarily water. So if you see how much of that energy comes from protein, that's quite a lot. Cheese concentrates that protein 25 to 35 percent, and they also are highly digestible, so good uh, sources of protein, uh, of course. But, like we said at the beginning, not the only ones. Nuts and seeds, for example, from the vegetable world, are very good sources of protein. They have a lot of protein. Uh, again, just some examples, peanuts, well, peanuts is technically a legume, but nutritionally, we don't care. Walnuts, 24%, sunflower seeds, it's the same seeds. Um, they are good sources of protein, and they also have a pretty good protein quality. Not as good as the animal food. It, they could use a touch of lysine uh, more, but overall it's good. However, these are very energy-dense foods, so you can only eat so much, which is the reason then why you will then turn to, for example, whole grain cereals. And they also, if they are whole, have uh, quite a lot of protein. Um, not as much, as you can see, as nuts and seeds, but of course you will eat more. So a serving of pasta is of course bigger than a serving of uh, sunflower seeds. Um, and they also have a composition that's surprisingly close to the animal sources. However, they have one big problem. They lack one essential amino acid. They have only one third of the lysine. But because we said if you just miss one, you know, you're in trouble you cannot use the other, this dramatically lowers their quality. So cereals by themselves have very low protein, well, fairly low protein quality. There are the, the pseudo cereals here, quinoa, amaranth, they're not technically cereals, but they are nutritionally close. However, they have a little bit more of this uh, lysine. So they have a slightly better protein quality. And then we also have legumes, lentils, chickpeas, Soybeans, 36 percent, that ends up being even more than meat. But they also have a, a low protein quality because now they miss the sulfur-containing essential amino acids. Well, methionine is essential. Cysteine is another of those conditionally essential. But this also is enough to lower their protein quality uh, because of this lack of this essential amino acid. And soy and soy product, again, they have much higher uh, sulfur-related amino acid content, so they have a slightly higher protein quality. We then have fruits and vegetables. They have uh, good protein quality, uh, but they have very low protein amount. So it's, fruit is very, very low. Vegetable is slightly higher, but, higher, but still less than 3%. So it certainly contributes to your uh, protein requirement, but you could not get all the protein you need from vegetables alone. You would need to eat tons. I definitely can go to the previous slide. I can go to the first one. Far so good. <laughs> and finally, we also have some alternative sources of protein. Uh, you have here tofu from soy, tempeh from soy. Uh, corn is made from a uh, fungus, so it produces a lot of uh, good, fairly good quality protein. 
Saitan is made from uh, gluten, so from whole grains, the, the protein part of grain. Uh, whey protein from milk, this is rich in branched chain amino acid. And then, yeah, remember that there are, in other parts of the world, people that will eat insects. So this is mealworms, they, have, they are animals, so a rich source of cheap protein. This is a picture from a Vietnamese market with bugs and larvae and insects. Uh, good sources of protein, cheap. And tasteless. I don't know if you've ever tasted a bug. I did uh, a dry one. It was crispy with salt. It tasted salt and nothing else. So it's just once you're past the psychological barrier, yeah, that's fine. The last con concept I'd like to bring up today is the one of complementary. Is this working? I don't even think it's working. <clears throat> um, complementary proteins. So. The protein quality of a single food. Now we said, all right, these are the different food. Uh, this is the high quality, this is low quality. But you, you want to keep in mind that when you eat, you don't really care about the protein quality of a single food. Uh, what you care is about the protein quality of the meal, so the combination of food that you eat. And so two or more lower quality protein sources, if you eat them at the same meal, not necessarily the same dish, but at the same meal, certainly not one at lunch or one at dinner, because remember, you cannot store amino acids for later use. But if you eat them together, they can then compensate for essential amino acid deficiencies and thereby result in high quality uh, protein meal. And I have another real example to illustrate. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, so imagine again we want to build the same protein. This, this time I don't even have the names. I just have these three peptides um, made from a green amino acid, an orange amino acid, and a blue amino acid. Imagine we have this food, food one, that has 30 amino acids, 10 green, 10 orange, 10 blue. How many protein can we need? Can we build with this pool of amino acids? Well, of course, we can build 10, right? Because we take one, one, and one for 10 times. So we can make 10 molecules of the protein that we need. So we could say that the protein value of this food is 10. This food is a high quality protein food because it has all the amino acids that we need in just the right proportion. We'll be able to use all of them and make the protein that we need. Now imagine we have this other food that now has 10 green, 18 orange, and two blue. And notice that the total protein content is the same. It is still 30 amino acids. So the grams of protein would be the same. But now, how many of our protein can we make? Well, of course, we can only make two. Because after that, we will be out of blue, and we will not be able to build any other of the protein that we need. So we can build two, and blue is the limiting amino acid. We don't have enough to go on building. And we will have, because we cannot store them, remember, we will have to get rid of eight green and six in orange. So, the protein value of this food is much lower, is only two. We can only make two proteins. Same amount of protein, but lower quality. And also, let's now take this other food, food three. Uh, now it has a different combination, 10 green, two orange, 18 blue. Again, we can only make two protein, because then this time the orange will be limiting, and we will have to throw away eight green and 16 blue. And so the protein value of this food is also only two. But now imagine that we take food two and food three together. Uh, I halve the amount because I want the total amount of protein to be the same. So again, we only have 30 amino acids total, but now the lack of orange in one would be compensated by the other and vice versa for the blue. So how many protein can we now build? We have 10 green, 10 orange, 10 blue. We can again see how they complement each other, they kind of mutually integrate each other. We can again build 10 of our proteins. We don't have anything to discard. So the protein value of the combination of these two foods is now 10, which is more than just the sum of the individual food. If I eat one at lunch and one at dinner, I will have two and two, four, for protein quality. But if I eat them together, because of the way they integrate each other, then I have a much higher protein content. So it's two low-quality food, 
by eating them together, we make a high protein quality meal. And the um, most important practical application of this concept is uh, cereals and legumes. They are uh, the typical example of complementary proteins. Because we said cereals uh, are all right, they're good, but they lack lysine, and, but they have a lot of methionine and cysteine. And then legumes, legumes then they, they have low methionine and cysteine, but then they have high lysine. If we eat them together, they complement each other and provide all the essential amino acids. So if you combine them in the right proportion, which is about two-thirds uh, cereals and one-third legumes, now you have the same protein quality uh, that you would have with animal protein. So if I eat my chickpeas hummus on a slice of whole grain bread, then I have complement. And finally, uh, I'd like to uh, show you the way your government wants you to eat now. So this is a new uh, plate, which is the evolution of your, my pyramid, which I think is like in your book, which is the evolution of the food pyramid, which was, I think, more intuitive. Um, it is, for protein, as you can see, it's kind of weird. Well, aside from the fact that you have this dish, that to my Italian side, you know, I wouldn't want my pasta with sauce anywhere near my strawberries, but uh, the thing is protein is not a food. Protein is a nutrient. So you have dairy here, which I assume to be milk, since it appears to be in a glass. But if it is cheese, then it would have to go here. You know, it, it would be a protein source. You, want, you don't want to eat meal and cheese together. And what about grains? Grains are also, uh, and now it's like, sources of protein. Thank you. So I can say goodbye and everything can, everybody can hear me. So you see, yeah, it's kind of weird. I think that unless you read the explanation, most people would infer that this is animal uh, protein. And then grain, what did it cost to put a whole, whole grain? Because it changes everything. If it's refined, it's not sugar. You know, it's starch, but your enzyme will degrade it so fast that it's just as you were eating sugar straight from the sugar bubble. But okay, so this is it. At least it gives you the message that this is the amount of protein you need in your food. And thank you for your attention. I'll see you on Wednesday. Can you can hear me from back there. Yeah. I, I think the opposite sounds good.